Poultry Wranglers on this Farm to Fork, Wyoming. Production of Farm to Fork, Wyoming is made possible with the generous support of the Wyoming Business Council, Agribusiness Division, and viewers like you. Thank you. In local small-scale farming, there are as many ways to raise a chicken as there are poultry wranglers. How many chickens you got? I don't know. <laughs> In Star Valley, Paul Smith's Chicken Ranch raises both meat and egg producing flocks. I'm thinking I'm at about 450 hens right now. This is where they roost at night, up on the, the roost, they fill that right up. On Sonia Becker's family stock farm in Thermopolis, chickens are integrated into her crop and livestock grazing rotations. Unfortunately, all the pretty pictures you see of the little cute little chicken houses for everybody's backyard isn't real realistic on a farm scale. <laughs> so chicken manure everywhere and uh, they scratch every living thing out of the ground so there's no grass. Near Cheyenne, LaDonna Foley enjoys both whimsical and practical heritage breeds. I have a Polish out there that was my kid's pet chicken. She has this big crest that comes down over her eyes. She's really a coop chicken. She's beautiful, she's fun, she has a good temperament. She can't see worth beans. She gets lost in the yard. <laughs> The highly adaptable chicken has accompanied us for about 8,000 years now. Where the domestic chickens trace back to is the red jungle fowl and also some of the gray jungle fowl now that they've just recently discovered. Adaptable and entertaining, the jungle fowl proved to be a natural traveler and companion. Almost all the different groups that have been exploring have taken chickens with them to their new areas. Both uh, the Polynesian explorers and uh, European explorers, when they were moving, were bringing chickens. Um, often they were not brought as a food source. They were often brought as entertainment. Romans seem to have been the first to raise chickens for meat. But with the fall of that empire, only the Dorking is thought to have survived. But the chicken endured through medieval times for barter and eggs. By the 1700s, the chicken had its renaissance. Breeds began to appear for both meat and egg production. By the 1900s, an abundance of fine regional breeds were enjoyed throughout Europe. As the American West was settled by homesteaders, chickens found their place in these rustic barnyards. You know, when settlers were coming west and when we were having lots of small farms, um, chickens were a very good animal to bring with them for a lot of reasons. You know, one is that it's a low input source for a good protein. When one or two chickens or a small flock don't take a whole lot of food. Also, they grow faster. You know, you're looking at getting an egg every day or every couple of days. You're looking at, with even the heritage breeds, you know, four to six months between having your chick hatch and having a chick, the chicken that you can have for dinner. Uh, these are smaller animals that are going to be easy to handle, especially if your labor force are your children. So, so there are a whole bunch of really positives. By the mid-1800s, American homesteaders were showing off their own special breeds.
Today, a variety of these heritage breeds have taken up roost in many of our small egg laying operations. I can't tell myself no. <laughs> hey, that one's cute. Let me try that one. Um, I have had to recently start, um, I'll buy one variety per year because I was just buying willy-nilly mixed match package. Um, I like the diversity of the color of eggs. My customers like the diversity of the color of the eggs. Paul also works with a variety of heritage breeds for his laying hens. All the different colors here in the birds uh, represent different ages. The black astralorps, the oldest, the black ones with the red or black sex links. They're next. Um, the white ones are Rhode Island whites. Mm -hmm. And then the Rhode Island reds. And then the cinnamon queens came on last December. One of the things we see on our small farms also is our heritage breeds were developed for specific environments. I raise a chicken that was developed for cold weather because I live in Wyoming, right? Um, I tend to try to stick with things with smaller crowns, generally because they don't freeze. Um, anything with a great big huge crown tends to get frosted and that's um, kind of hard on them, yeah. Some birds were primarily for egg layers, and those breeds tend to be lean and slim. Um, your meat breeds are wider and heavier. We have our dual purpose breeds, which are a little bit of both. So, you know, it's a balancing act between where are you gonna put your energy? Are you putting your energy into making meat? Are you putting your energy into laying eggs? Or are you gonna balance it so you get a little bit of both? It wasn't until after World War I that the chicken became a favorite at the dinner table. That showed up in the American South. Kentucky Fried Chicken is famous for a reason, not just because of Kentucky Fried Chicken, but really eating a lot of chicken supposedly developed in the South because chickens were one of the few animals that uh, slaves could raise or people of any means. This wasn't a very expensive animal to keep. It wasn't prohibited from the slaves to keep chickens. So chickens really became popular as an American food. And then it grew from there. Between World War I and World War II, selective breeding reached an entirely new level. Close to World War II and right afterwards, we made these huge strides in genetic selection and really pushing for single production traits versus a number of traits there. This is the uh, white rock. Feel that breast on that thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's like a turkey. Oh my gosh. That is. Yeah, they, wow. these will dress at over eight pounds. From the late 30s through the 50s, our meat chickens started going from taking 16, 18 weeks to grow up to eight to 10 weeks to grow up. A huge, huge shift. But that rapid growth came with a lack of stamina needed for the rigors of living on pasture at 6,200 feet. I started raising the Cornish Cross. If you fed them all they wanted, they were dead in eight weeks. If you didn't control their lights, they were dead in six weeks. Our commercial birds were increasingly selected for the new industrial egg model. At the same time, we're starting to lose a lot of our small farms. Then we started losing these uh, breeds that were adapted for specific environments in specific places. Today, breeders like LaDonna focus on the preservation of these small farm breeds. I, I chose them because they're a heritage bird. They're really good in cold weather. They were developed in Alberta, Canada as a farm, dual purpose farm chicken. Um, but I really like their personality. It's really one of the reasons why I like the heritage breeds is because I want something that's going to be easy to handle. And that's something that you're going to select for. If you are out on a small farm or you're homesteading someplace and your children are the ones taking care of your chickens, you don't want to have a bird that's going to be aggressive or hard to handle. 
right? Um, when we look at our very modern breeds where we are only selecting for egg laying ability, we did a really great job selecting for egg laying ability in our commercial chickens, but their temperaments aren't all that great in many cases because that hasn't been something that was important. And coloration of the breeds was for more than aesthetic purposes. The partridge chanticleers, which I raised, were specifically bred to be that dark brown color with the black in it because some of the people feel that that coloration is easier for the chickens to hide into and they're going to be less likely to be picked off by predators, where the white birds, which we often like for our commercial purposes because you don't see any pin feathers on the carcass, then uh, they really stand out and a lot of people feel those white birds, the hawks get them first, the foxes are going to get them first. For Sonia and Paul's free-ranging flocks, guardian dogs keep predators at bay. This one is my Marima's territory and she takes her guarding very seriously. Um, you can just put her out here and she'll stay right with them day and night. This is Queenie. She's my chicken guard dog. She oh. goes out on pasture with the dog, with the chickens. She actually goes out and stays with them. She's currently unemployed. She's, well, right she'll sort of keep track of the, the laying hens and stuff and, and, uh, and the general area. But, uh, but uh, yeah, she's, she goes out there and protects those guys. And, and so when I have them on pasture, they don't have any protection whatsoever. There's no pen, oh. there's no crate, there's no fence, really? there's no nothing. This unconfined system allows chickens the freedom to behave according to their nature and forage for their most nutritious part of their diet. During the season when we've got the chickens on pasture, I take the milk cows out and then we, we uh, do management intensive grazing on the milk cows and they, um, they get strip grazed. So every day we move the fence twice a day, morning and night, they all get a new fresh piece of grass. And the chickens come in the chicken mobile <laughs> afterwards and they follow the cows every couple of days behind them they're coming along so they scratch the manure they eat the bugs they take care of all that kind of stuff but that gets done um, with the with the tractor we haul along behind them and then they can follow the cows through the through the pasture and the symbiotic relationship helps to control parasites on the farm a lot of people do feel that the chickens help with you know the fly control they'll go through they'll eat you know maggots and they eat worms and, diff and different things like that and i don't have a worm problem with my cows um, i had a sample tested by the vet not a worm to be found really? and that's the chickens Huh. They come through and they just clean everything up and there just isn't that, that it stops that cycle. The on farm protein source is part of what you might call a slow food system. It harkens back to a time when farms and farm animals functioned in a more holistic, self-sufficient manner. When you go back into the old showmen and um, into some of the old books, people developed their own rations because we didn't have big companies doing that then, and they became very elaborate. Meat proteins were an important part of the ration, which often came from meat scraps, but also from foraging. They're scroungers. They're, they're eating bugs. They're eating anything that they come across. If they find a mouse, look out, mouse. <laughs> because chickens are not vegetarians. <laughs> yeah. and, and I actually don't think that uh, feeding a vegetarian diet to, a, to an omnivore is the best thing to feed them. They weren't developed to do that. There is uh, an amino acid that's actually not supplied from a vegetarian diet. They can only get that from a meat-based or you know, having some meat in their diet. So you are seeing uh, birds going out and ranging. They're gonna have to be catching their own feed in that case. And so you'll see chickens uh, will chase down insects. A couple of years ago, we had lots of grasshoppers in this area. I didn't have problems with grasshoppers around my house because my birds were eating really well. <laughs> And a lot of what we're seeing, is, especially in the very old-time heritage breeds, is that they need to have more protein in their diet 
to produce well and to have good feather quality and to grow to their maximum potential than what we do in our more modern layers. And one example is um, the standard layer feed that you're going to find now in the feed store is 16% protein. And that seems to work well for the commercial uh, breeds that we have. But some, a lot of our older breeds, um, the people who are raising them are starting out feeding 20% protein because people used to feed a lot more meat scraps to their birds than what they do now. In the heritage breeds, there is an emphasis on strength, natural health, and longevity. For heritage breeds of chickens, we're looking at long productive lifespan. So instead of 18 months of laying eggs, you're looking at hens that are going to be laying eggs for like three to five years. Well, we're looking at them developing their bone structure and you know strong organs before they're putting on their meat or starting to lay eggs. And so these animals take a little bit longer to mature than the more modern production breeds. Usually six months before we're seeing them lay eggs, probably four months before you're looking at a meat animal. Striking that balance of nutrition, growth rate, and quality of life for animal, farm, and customer is the goal in pastured poultry. I try to think of what the customer, consumer, you know, would think as he looks at it and try to, try to do the things I would, myself would think we should be doing for them. It's like the old saying, you know, you can have it good, fast, or cheap, <laughs> pick two. You know, that goes, that goes true with the animals also. In an effort to give the customer what they're used to, Sonia has experimented with different breeds. Have you worked with other breeds? I did the, I did the, um, the Red Rangers um, one year, and they, they take, under my conditions, the way I feed them, it takes even longer. You know, I, I would end up having to butcher them in November instead of in, in July to, in order to get them up to the weight that I'd like to have them at. And I, I end up with a bunch that, that will range anywhere from two and a half pounds to five pounds. I'm sort of of the opinion that if you're going to get a bird, I want, you know, I want fresh chicken tonight and then I want, you know, sandwich chicken tomorrow and I want soup the next day. I, I want a chicken that I can, you know, have several meals out of and not just, you know, have a little two pound chicken that you know, one meal and you're done. So I like them a little bigger. Birds raised for meat today are typically hybrids. The very common meat crosses is a Cornish rock cross, where you're taking a Cornish uh, bird verse and putting it on a rock. I'm trying to develop my own Cornish. So I've got the, the white rocks, and I've got the Cornish roosters, and I'm going to collect eggs and, and hatch out this fall and see if I can get something that sort of resembles a bird. And when you cross your breeds like that, sometimes you get what's called hybrid vigor, and where the animals are going to grow faster than either of the individual parent breeds would be alone. They're not a breed in themselves. They will not breed true. But that is one of the most popular meat birds out there, and they're very efficient in how they're dealing with their feed and turning it into meat. Sonia's Cornish Cross spends three to four months on pasture. And then this is the tractor that goes with them all the time. So this is a, a feeder wagon for round bales, a cow feeder wagon, and we just converted it into the chicken thing. The chickens can, can roost underneath, so they have shade and protection um, underneath the thing. We have a drip system on this side for, for watering. That's the way they drank. They actually were a jungle fowl and take the drips off of the leaves. Oh. So this is the natural way as opposed to getting it in a bowl. If you look at them, if you watch them when they get in a bowl, they put their mouth down and then they tip their heads up yeah, right. and suck it down their throat. Well, this way it just runs right down the way it's supposed to. But um, it's so clean. You don't end up with any of the manure into the water. Um, right. It's just much more sanitary for the chickens. We fill the garbage cans and the dumpster up with their grain. Mm -hmm. And so that gets transported. And every day, we just jump on the tractor, move it forward, wow. and away it goes. That's good. So this is what we're feeding them. It's mostly ground hay. Oh. There is about 30% grain in there, and the rest of it is hay and that's what they grow on. And mine don't grow nearly as quickly as the conventional 
raised chickens. I mean, I, I got the birds the end of March mm. and we're just now butchering them. So wow. it, it's a lot slower, but I'd rather they grow slower and mm. not spend huge amounts, you know, cramming a bunch of feed into them. They're out on pasture, they get the bugs, they get the, the green growth um, mm. as well as, as, as the feed. Mm. Um, but it's just so much cheaper to feed them that way than mm. to, to buy the, you know, I can't get the organic feed the way I'd like and, and so I have a limited supply and this, they get plenty fat on this. And my broilers, of course, are not heritage breeds at all, mm. but, um, but they can still grow on, on, okay. on hay. After three and a half months on pasture, it was harvest day for this flock. So in the last week before we bring the broilers in to harvest them, we take the horse trailer out and then we start feeding them in the horse trailer. So they get in the habit of running in the horse trailer in the evening. Oh. And so then that, um, that night before we get ready to slaughter them, um, we just pretend like we're going to feed them in the horse trailer and they all run in. You slow, slam the doors. You have a few stragglers you have to pick up, but then they all end up in here for the, for the night and we bring it over here to get ready for slaughter. Humane treatment is a priority from beginning to end. Get her going. We try to just sever the arteries in the neck. Then we, we try to take out the one that's been in the rack the longest, and that's why we keep track of which one we start with generally so that we can um, make sure that they've completely passed away. And then they come over, they go into the scalder, um, which is set at 160 degrees. Then they go into the plucker, um, which Tosses them all over, cleans most of the feathers off. Once they're done with that, they're gonna go over here onto the table. We'll take the feet off. We'll uh, take any pin feathers, anything that didn't get pulled off completely will come off on that table. <laughs> then they come down to this area and we end up putting, um, taking all the innards out, which ends up in our compost afterwards. And then keep all the liver and the heart uh -huh. and the gizzard. And they're good innards. Um, and then once they come out, then they go into the bulk tank, which has ice and um, cold water put in it. And so then they sit in there and they actually will stay in there until tomorrow morning. And then we'll pull them out, we'll drain them, we'll bag them. Um, so that way they have enough time for the rigor mortis to go through its natural processes. I don't have enough refrigerator space to try to cram them all in a refrigerator. So we wait until the next day before we, uh, before we put them in the bags and then they'll go into a freezer. Being able to buy local raised poultry and eggs is becoming more common all the time. I think there's more mindfulness going on in the food, what we're putting into our bodies, what we want to put our food dollars towards. Um, and I really think the small producer is giving the consumer a choice. And our consumers are responding. People are really interested in that. And Paul's chicken ranch raised eggs are served daily at Persephone's in Jackson. It's very nice um, to support the actual local food community here. I think it's really important to try to source ingredients as close to home as you can. Knowing how the animals live, how they're treated, you know, humanely treated, knowing that they're eating the natural um, grasses and insects and, and all those things coming from this region is, is pretty exceptional. It's driven mostly by the customers and what I hear them say and what I hear them wanting you know i'm not big into organic because i think it's got too many holes in it but providing a good product and treating the animals uh, with the respect i think as they should be treated that's part of the the fun of it chickens are not the only valuable farm fowl for ladonna there is much to love about ducks I, I really love ducks quite a bit. And uh, one of the things that I really like about ducks is that they're awesome layers. You know, we have just, we have different breeds of ducks. Some are for meat, some are for eggs, and some are for both. Um, but you're looking, on average, most of your ducks are laying even better than our very highest producing chickens. Chickens are laying 28 to 34 pounds worth of eggs in a year and your ducks are laying like, you know, 32 to 38 pounds. Ducks tend to lay every 24 hours, and so they don't skip a day as often as chickens do, and they tend to have larger yolks 
in them also. Those big yolks give extra creaminess to your cakes and your pies and your pastries. Um, the whites of duck eggs actually have more tinsel strength than chicken eggs do. So when you cook them, they, they cook up firmer. And if you have anything that you want to hold a rise or to hold air, like if you have heavy bread or you're making gluten-free foods with, say, an almond flour that tends to be heavy, those duck eggs you can whip up and when you, and when you cook it, it's gonna help hold that air into your bread and make your bread have a lighter mouth feel. When I go to a farmer's market, I'm bringing eggs that are really, really fresh. And I'm bringing animals um, that have had a specific type of lifestyle. I'm not looking at just being the cheapest and the fastest. And there are a lot of consumers out there who appreciate that. <laughs>